All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, the 2019 protocol assessment. Uh, I'm Paul Zeeb, and I'm here with Mike Stoner. And we're your medical directors uh, for MEC EMS. So uh, the first thing I would like to talk about is just uh, a few opening comments uh, about this procedure. Uh, this is an open book review of the protocol. Uh, I encourage you to do this as part of a group learning op uh, opportunity with your uh, company officers and with the uh, crew that's on duty with you. Um, there is no pass-fail grade, so we're not looking for an 80% uh, correct answer rate. But in order to pass and get credit for doing this, you have to take the assessment either alone uh, or uh, via group learning. And then you have to review this video, uh, which it goes through all the answers, at least as we see them as being correct. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about the answers, um, there is contact information at the end. Uh, we have made every attempt to make these questions clear. Uh, if there is an answer that is uh, anything other than which is the correct answer, uh, then we highlight uh, is not or which is incorrect. So there's no attempt to fool you. Uh, simply interested in you going for the best correct answer. Mike, you got any other comments? No, it sounds good. Just watch for the best answer or all the above or not. Yes, and some of these questions do have multiple answers. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of banter between the two of us as uh, part of this, uh, which will hopefully increase the entertainment value for you. Always a plus. So the first question is mine. Uh, has to do with sepsis. Uh, keep in mind that sepsis is a deadly disease. If for patients who arrive alive at the hospital, they're more likely to die from sepsis than if they suffer major trauma or a STEMI. So patients who alive, arrive alive to the hospital with STEMI or trauma have less than a 5% chance of dying, whereas septic patients, depending on the facilities, have anywhere from a 20 to a 50% chance of dying. So this question is specific to sepsis, uh, which has become one of the time critical events. Uh, which statement is not true uh, or is not one of the criteria to initiate uh, treatment for sepsis? So infection is suspected, temperature more than 100.4, uh, end tidal CO2 greater than 40, heart rate more than 70, or respiratory rate greater than 20. Well, the uh, question in, or, uh, correct uh, answer uh, is uh, end tidal greater than 40. Uh, we do consider end tidal CO2 as part of our determination of sepsis, but the correct answer is an end tidal CO2 of less than 25. Uh, less than 25 is highly correlated with a, um, a lactate level over 4. Lactate is something we measure as part of sepsis. Uh, so if you in suspect infection and the patient has a temperature over 100.4, a heart rate over 90, or a respiratory rate over 20, then uh, they meet criteria. Actually, uh, the criteria indicate they have to have suspected infection, and uh, two out of the three others are correct. So they have temperature, uh, heart rate, or respiratory rate, any two of those three, uh, then they are considered septic and should be treated with fluid bolus and transported to the hospital. The next question uh, is, you have a 25-year-old male who's involved in MVA. He's ambulatory, he's got no distracting injuries, he's got no spinal tenderness, and has uh, no intoxication. Uh, do you have to put them in a cervical collar? Um, do you have to use spinal motion restrictions? The correct answer is no, uh, and that's because the patient, um, uh, based on our protocol, has no findings to suggest need of significant spinal injury. They do not need to be placed in a cervical collar. Uh, uh, they should be transported if they have uh, any uh, conditions that require assessment or if the patient uh, requests transfer. But uh, for this patient, spinal immobilization is not required. Third question, you've got a patient uh, who suffered a narcotic overdose. Um, it's obvious that she is impaired because of the overdose. Uh, she's not breathing well and that you administer Narcan. So the question is, how much Narcan do you give? What is your end point when do you stop giving Narcan? Do you do it when the patient's fully awake and alert? Uh, do you do it when there's return or stop when there's return of adequate respirations? Or do you uh, continue Narcan until the patient's awake, vomiting, diaphoretic, and violent? In other words, do you give them enough Narcan to put them into withdrawal? Well, the correct question is a pediatric question. Oh, this one's mine. All right. Uh, you pull in, you're treating a three-year-old boy who has acute croup symptoms. They are having a barky cough. They're having some strider. Um, which statement is uh, incorrect? So which is the wrong statement? Do you give them racemic epinephrine? Uh, do you give them dexamethasone 0.6 milligrams and max out at 20 milligrams? Do you, uh, once you've given them the racemic epi, do you have to transport them to the hospital? 
and uh, or you do need to watch them for rebound after the receiving cafe is given. And the correct answer is um, the wrong answer is the, the decadron. The correct answer for that is yes, it is 0. 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, but our protocols max out at 10 milligrams, not, not the 20. Um, the rest of them are, are true. If they're having really increased work to breathing, uh, racemic epinephrine is helpful. It does wear off um, within a few minutes up to an hour, so we gotta watch for a rebound. So, and in that case, if you have given it to them, you need to make sure you take them to the hospital so that um, the rebound happens uh, in an observed setting and not back in the house. Yeah, and in the past we have given Decadron uh, because it helps, but it also it shortens the uh, ED length of stay uh, by whatever your transport time is, because Decadron takes some time to work. Correct, it'll um, take a few minutes to kick in. And, and for kids, uh, one dose is enough. One dose, for the most part, does it all. And we can give um, the IV form of uh, dexamethasone orally. Um, uh, it is absorbed and has the same effect. That's a very good point. Our hospital has actually gone to that. We've had a shortage of some of the oral dexamethasone, so we've gone to giving the IV. It doesn't taste great, but it's a small volume, and uh, it works. Um, and the oral dose, since I was mentioned, works just as well as a, an, um, an IM dose, so give it to them by mouth. Another pediatric question. Man, two in a row. All right, you are treating a five-year-old, 22-kilogram uh, young girl, has a history of seizure disorder. Um, you come up and she's actively seizing on your arrival. What is the best treatment for her to break her seizures? Do you give her two milligrams of midazolam IM, intramuscular? Do you give her five milligrams of uh, midazolam intranasal and then check a blood sugar on her? Um, do you stop, put in an IV, and then give her two milligrams of midazolam intravenously? Or do you go for the rectal diazepam, the diastat, provided by the mother? Drum roll, please. Correct so, answer. Correct answer is the, uh, the five milligrams intranasal. It's the quickest route. It's readily available, and that would be the route I would go. Um, yes, definitely check a blood sugar. Um, as for the dosing, you go down your intranasal, or you go down your uh, seizure pathway. It has the dose of Versed, but it does say preferred intranasally. So then you flip over to your intranasal pathway. And for her weight, it's all weight-based, and she would fall into the 5 milligram dosing. Yeah, and I think the key point on this is uh, intravenous midazolam works faster, but if you arrive on scene with a seizing patient, whether it's an adult or a child, it can take time to administer or to obtain an IV uh, and then give the, the patient uh, the IV midazolam. So the quickest way to break the seizure is to give it to them intranasally. It's rapidly absorbed, and studies show that uh, time to termination of seizure with intranasal uh, medication is quicker than IV if the patient does not have an IV at the time of first contact. Right. The, uh, the one thing down on the bottom, uh, D, the, uh, the diastat, the rectal diazepam, I think we're, our neurologists, at least at Children's, are getting away from that. Some people still have it. Um, it the absorption is not quite as quick. It doesn't uh, act as quickly. And as one mother put it to me once to try to take her teenage boy who is 150 pounds and pull his pants down while he's seizing to give him rectal diastat um, is not the easiest thing. So the nose is always available. Good point. Question six, um, you have a 70-year-old male who was last normal 45 minutes prior to arrival. Um, he has a right facial droop. He uh, cannot hold his right arm up. In matter of fact, it drops quickly, and he's got no grip in the right hand. So uh, you promptly identify that this patient's had a stroke, and now you have to make a decision regarding destination. Uh, you have three options available. Do you take the patient to an acute stroke-ready hospital, which is about a seven-minute transport? Uh, about 10 minutes away, um, you have a primary stroke center, and 15 minutes away, you have a comprehensive stroke center. So where are you going to go? Well, the, the correct answer is we're going to take that patient to a comprehensive stroke center. If you look at uh, his LAM score, which is what we use to determine severity of the stroke and whether or not the patient may have suffered a large vessel occlusion, uh, this patient has a LAM score of 5, which is the highest you can get. He's got the facial weakness, his arm drops quickly, and he has no grip. Um, our protocol um, requires that if you have access to a comprehensive stroke center, uh, 
with the only an incremental increase in transport time of 15 minutes or less versus other receiving facilities, then a patient with a LAMS of four or five should go to the comprehensive stroke center. And the reason we do that is because this patient may be a candidate for clot extraction. Uh, he will be uh, treated first with IV thrombolytics, um, but uh, studies that have been published in the past two, two years definitively show that patients with uh, large vessel occlusion um, have better outcomes if they have uh, immediate or ready access to an interventional facility that can uh, extract the clot. So this patient uh, should be taken uh, that extra eight minutes in transport time to a comprehensive stroke facility uh, for clot extraction. What are uh, big differences between the, the three different types? An acute stroke ready hospital uh, has been evaluated by the Joint Commission, which is the accrediting agency, as having the capability to rapidly assess a patient, uh, rapidly obtain a non-contrast CT, uh, has a process in place to administer TPA quickly, and then uh, transport the patient to a uh, primary or comprehensive stroke facility. A primary stroke center uh, has increased capabilities, um, generally uh, can do everything up to the point of clot extraction. Um, some primary stroke centers can do clot extractions, but they uh, are limited in terms of any other uh, stroke interventions such as coiling of an aneurysm uh, and immediate access to neurosurgical care. Comprehensive stroke centers have uh, full scope of service uh, for stroke care, anywhere from TPA only to uh, aggressive interventions such as coiling as aneurysms, extractions of clots. Uh, and they have a much more rigorous uh, quality improvement program in place. So uh, comprehensive is the highest level. Acute stroke ready is basically um, quick access to thrombolytics, but there's no expectation the patient's gonna be kept at that facility. Once the thrombolytic is given, they are transported to uh, another facility. And I'm learning so much. I might learn some peas too. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Which IV access device um, uh, can a, a EMS provider not access? So uh, recently we added some special uh, procedures uh, in case you have uh, uh, access or, or different types of patients, and we've added that uh, our providers can access certain types of uh, central uh, venous catheters. So uh, saline lock or heparin well, that's the peripheral IV that's capped off. Uh, can, uh, can you access that? Can you access a PIC line, which is essentially a central line uh, or a central venous catheter? It's inserted peripherally. So instead of putting it in through the groin, shoulder, or neck, it's inserted usually in the arm, and the catheter is fed up into the uh, superior vena cava. Can you access a subcutaneous port, which is a access device that is buried under the skin, requires special needles for access? Um, or can you send, access a central line that's present, such as a subclavian line, internal jugular line, or Broviac catheter, one of those lines? So which one can you not access based upon our protocol? Well, the correct answer is subcutaneous port, uh, and that's because uh, it is subcutaneous. It requires uh, special access needles. Um, it requires uh, special care. Uh, EMS providers um, do have, I think, the knowledge and capability of doing it, but, you know, MEC EMS has over 600 providers, and to assure that all of them are appropriately trained to an access a subcutaneous port and to expect 17 agencies to carry special right-angle needles that will not uh, damage the uh, port, I think that's unrealistic for us. Um, so for now, accessing subcutaneous ports uh, is not part of our protocol. And I assume for kids, it's probably similar. Very similar. They're very protective of their, their ports. And, and our ED nurses, there's a very small percentage of them that are allowed to touch those ports too. So Yeah, our, our nurses have to, they have to basically wear masks. They have to prep the skin oh, yeah. in a prep, special way. They have to use sterile gloves. They have to put a protective uh, cap or whatever over the needle once it's uh, inserted. Uh, and I think for us to do that in the field is unrealistic. Uh, another comment, which is really not related to this question, but is accessing uh, dialysis catheters. Uh, the nephrologists and the nephro or dialysis centers are very protective of their catheters. Uh, we can access them in true life and death situations, but uh, we should not access them unless the patient is dying in front of us. Um, those, those also should be protected because if they get infected, the patient is hosed. Uh, and they end up needing a, a new device. 
and we should do everything we can to protect uh, their dialysis uh, access ports because uh, after a while patients run out of options. Mm -hmm. All right, 20-month-old. Uh, I'm up. 20-month-old, she was in her house, she pulled a pot of ramen noodles off of the stove and it fell on top of her, unfortunately. She's burnt her entire trunk, her left thigh, and her left foot. Um, she did not get her face, fortunately. So the question is, what is the most appropriate option below? So question A, or answer A, uh, pain control and follow up with her doctor in the morning. B, bring her to the nearest hospital. C, pain control with nasal fentanyl, cover her with a dry dressing and then bring her to a burn center. Or D, um, dress her up with some antimi antimicrobial cream or ointment such as silvadine or, um, or Neosporin or something like that. And the answer is yes, definitely pain control. Nasal fentanyl is probably the quickest, easiest route. Rarely do people burn themselves with IVs in place. So that would be rapid. And then, right, keep her dry, keep it dry. Don't put a bunch of goo on it. And then uh, bring them to, the, uh, to a burn center. So I mentioned the, the different areas that are burnt and why is that important? And it actually, for the answer to the question, you just need to cover it and make sure she's comfortable and bring her in. But it does help us on the front end knowing how much it is. So she's got her whole chest, which on the graph that'd be, what, 13%, a thigh, which would be another eight, so now we're at 21, and then a foot, which I believe is one-ish. Um, so your 22, 23% burn area. It affects us at the hospital, just knowing what kind of criteria for, at least for children's, Anything between 15 and 30 percent burn, body surface area is burn, is a, a level two trauma. And then so that will change that criteria. And over 30 percent will actually um, activate our level one trauma criteria. So that helps from the inbound so we know what to prepare for. And this, this uh, burn chart is, is available as part of our protocol if you have the uh, app on your phone or your tablet. Uh, if you take it, uh, you can click on the body part and it will automatically calculate percentage uh, burns. And then keep in mind that when we do calculations of burns, we don't think of or we don't count uh, first degree burns, but anything that's second or third degree is counted. Uh, I just have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, some of our crews carry those uh, colloid dressings that are kind of cool and moist. Uh, yeah. They do provide some comfort. Uh, do you use them or do you see much utility? In well, I don't. I think the, the transfer is going to be very quick and we're just going to rip it right back off. So I would say just cover something dry. And like I said, it would probably be more of a systemic analgesic than anything else. It, um, <laughs> so you know, this comes up of how much fluid to give the patient when we're talking about burns. There's the whole, I know Dr. Ziva mentioned that you can click on the graph and it will it will uh, fill in how much body surface area of the burn it is, and then everybody wants to go back to the Parkland formula. At least for pediatrics, our burn center, our burn doctors have gotten away from the Parkland formula and more likely are, are more likely to use a just continued amount of fluid, and they will regulate it once the child's admitted based on urine output. So unless the child's in shock, in which case bolus away, we don't necessarily need to have a lot of fluid bolus. The child was not dehydrated when it happened. Your transport time is very short. So IV access is great, but um, they don't need to get a bunch of fluid boluses and don't worry about calculating Parkland formula. Yeah. Question nine has to do with Haldol. So uh, we have a list of alternative medications that can be used if we face a shortage of uh, medicines. And Haldol is on that list of alternative medications. So Haldol uh, is an alternate medication for which drug? Zofran, uh, ketamine for pain control, uh, ketamine for combative patients, or fentanyl? So the correct answer is ketamine for combative patients. Um, ketamine we use for pain control. We do use Haldol sometimes at the hospital as an adjunct or a way of supplementing pain control. But at this point, I'm not advocating that for field use. Uh, Haldol does have some antiemetic effect, so at some point it might be an alternate for Zofran. Uh, but in terms of uh, our current uh, protocol, uh, Haldol is an alternative medication for combative uh, patients um, and when we don't have ketamine. Uh, 
Um, talking about ketamine, I'd just like to remind you that there's a difference between a patient who's anxious and slightly agitated, in which case we use midazolam, uh, versus a patient who's combative, meaning they're violent and placing their safety or the safety of EMS providers at risk. In that circumstance, we use ketamine and mix it with the, with the uh, uh, midazolam or Versed. See the more rapid effect from the ketamine? Is that what you're thinking? Oh, about? yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and it, it's, um, it basically, you know, it's a dissociative anesthetic, right. so it disconnects the brain from the body, and we, we see um, patients who calm down three to five minutes after an intramuscular dose. Really? Uh, IV, it's 45 to 60 seconds. Wow. Um, but it's amazing how quickly ketamine works uh, if given IM, and we give it in the thighs. Okay. Um, and we can, you can mix the uh, midazolam with the ketamine so that it's, it's two shots, um, usually one, you know, dividing the medicine between the thighs. You don't have to give a third shot of the Versed separately. And we primarily use the Versed uh, or midazolam to prevent emergence or those hallucinations people may suffer when they when cut they out of the ketamine. You don't have to deal with emergence, I understand, with kids, but adults sometimes, sometimes. can. Uh, geriatric trauma triage question. So uh, which of the following is not one of the Ohio geriatric trauma triage criteria? Keep in mind that we are obligated by state law to transport trauma patients to a trauma facility unless uh, there are extenuating circumstances in play. And then we have specific criteria that are related to geriatric trauma. Uh, the first uh, response is uh, two or more proximal long bone fractures. The second is a GCS of 14 or less with a suspected or known TBI. Uh, systolic BP less than 100 um, if it's an older patient who's struck by a car. Or uh, older patient uh, fall from any height, including standing with evidence of TBI or traumatic brain injury. And um, the, these criteria apply for patients over age 70. So the quick or the correct answer is number one. Uh, if you are under 70, then this would be correct. Two or more proximal long bone fractures, meaning femurs uh, and humerus, humeri. Um, but in the geriatric population, it's one uh, or more proximal long bone fractures. So uh, if you have a f one fractured femur in a, in a geriatric patient, that meets criteria. If you have two broken femurs in a younger patient, then it's trauma criteria. All the other criteria that we've got listed here are correct for geriatric trauma, GCS of 14 or less, non-geriatric is 13 or less, uh, systolic BP less than 100, non-geriatric is less than 90. Uh, pedestrian struck uh, is not a criteria for um, younger patients, but it could be used in terms of mechanism injury criteria, but for a geriatric patient, if they get hit by a car, then they're considered trauma. Uh, and then any fall from any height, um, I believe for uh, non-geriatrics patients, it's six feet or there's some other uh, height restriction. But if you have any older person who's standing uh, or any higher altitude uh, falls and hits their head with evidence of TBI, then they're considered a trauma patient. Next question has to do with uh, patient in cardiac arrest. This has to do with our clinical standard on uh, high performance CPR. What, you have a patient in cardiac arrest, what is your correct uh, list of priorities? The first one has to do with ventilation and then proceeding from there. Uh, the second choice has to do with you get IV access first, then you ventilate, and eventually you get around to doing CPR. And the final criteria or the final answer uh, is CPR with defibrillation, then ventilation, uh, moving the medic to charge position, and then IV access. Well, I think uh, everybody should be aware that uh, item C is the correct answer. So if uh, you are on scene, first on scene, uh, your first priority is CPR and defibrillation. If it, you're the only person on scene, then your only priority is, is CPR. If there are two or more people on scene, then it's CPR and setting up the patient for defibrillation if indicated. Uh, once you have a third person on scene, you can begin ventilating. And when I say ventilation, I'm talking about uh, just a BVM. Uh, we don't move toward definitive airway management until a little bit later in the game. Uh, we want to get the medic in a charge position, so that's our third priority. We need somebody who's running the code, somebody who makes decisions. Um, and then the, the, one of the last things we worry about is IV access, uh, which can either be a peripheral IV uh, or uh, an intraosseous device. 
Next question has to do with patient is, is an asystole, it's another cardiac arrest, uh, it's an atraumatic cardiac arrest and the patient's in the middle of the grocery section uh, or the produce section of the grocery store. Uh, you're there, you work the patient for 25 minutes, uh, you've done everything uh, that you can think of, but the patient remains in asystole and the end tidal CO2 is five. Uh, the question is, can you terminate uh, resuscitation at that point? Well, the patient does meet criteria for termination of resuscitation except for one sticking point. Uh, that one sticking point is he's in a public place, so you cannot mm -hmm. terminate. Uh, our process is that we do not terminate uh, resuscitation in a public place. Um, the reason we don't do that is because if we terminate, we're going to leave a dead person in the aisle of the produce section. Um, our goal is to not shut the business down. So uh, we should uh, transport that patient. We should continue resuscitative efforts and transport the patient uh, to uh, the hospital. Matter of fact, if you're in a public place, you might consider transporting sooner than 25 minutes and continuing your resuscitative efforts solely so that you get out of, out of the business. Uh, now, the, the one codicil I will give you is if the patient uh, is in cardiac arrest for some reasons that may have to do with uh, homicide or some legal issues involved, uh, then, um, or the patient's uh, had a, a, you know, a, a massive trauma and they're basically DOA, then it becomes a, a, a legal issue and I would terminate at that point and then uh, uh, leave the patient with law enforcement who can then manage it as a, as a, a, a scene of a crime. But assuming this is a, 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 just a run-of-the-mill cardiac arrest that unfortunately happened in a grocery store, uh, we would transport that patient uh, to a receiving hospital. So I assume you'd have the, the police would be there with you if it were a crime scene to kind of help yeah. direct that part of things. Yeah, and the police would probably be there anyway. Yeah. Um, and in some circumstances, the cops even get there first. Gotcha. Uh, but uh, I, would, I would not leave this patient lying in the middle of the grocery section or the produce section. Yeah. So I, this has nothing to do with vegetables, though, because I think if they're in dairy, you do the same thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is the one that I actually got wrong because I didn't know why. So I'm glad you explained that. What else are you going to do? But it makes sense. The yep. public place is the yeah, I mean, answer. legally, you could leave the patient there. Right. But from a customer service right. perspective, I, uh, I, I don't think it, it bodes well for the fire department. Perfect. Sure. Oh, back up. All right. So you are dispatched to a local school. Hey, this is my son, exactly, um, for an injury. Uh, you find a 10-year-old boy, fell off the jungle gym, and has a deformed uh, left forearm. You can see the picture here. Um, he's in severe pain. He's got uh, uh, good distal pulses. And so the first question is, what do you do? What is the preferred method to control this child's pain? So A, you have fentanyl intranasally, 1.5 micrograms per kilogram. Uh, B, um, can you give him a, milli, uh, excuse me, a microgram of fentanyl per kilogram IM or intramuscularly? Uh, do we jump to ketamine and do 0.2 milligrams per kilogram IM? Or do we place an IV and give him two micrograms per kilogram IV? So the correct answer is A. So 1.5 micrograms per kilogram intranasally. Again, similar to the, uh, the seizure patient that we had, intranasal route is, is the most available. Um, you could say it's not hard to give them something intramuscularly. Um, I would say that that's less comfortable, plus um, you're probably better off just going intranasally. Um, as for the other ones, viable options, I think I would, uh, I think your, your ketamine's a little bit on the lower dose for pain control and your fentanyl is a little on the higher dose with the IV access, but A is your best shot. And I can tell you, you make a lot of friends with the parents if you give them a dose of intranasal fentanyl. Oh, yeah. Uh, I actually had a kid with a broken uh, humerus last night and I gave him uh, uh, 1.5 uh, mics per kilo intranasally with two doses and the control was very good. He maintained his airway uh, and mother was very appreciative. So some of, when we first rolled out with the intranasal fentanyl, some of my nurses were very concerned about um, rigid chest. Fentanyl, are we gonna have problems? I don't think it's ever been reported with the intranasal route. So it's quite safe when using it for that method and in controlled settings and at that dosing. All right, another child here. So you were called and you just delivered your first baby, it's a term female infant. Uh, the child comes out, is kind of dusky appearing, has poor respiratory efforts, 
you check a umbilical stump heart rate and you find it to be 90, what is the first thing you do? Do you grab your bag and start to ventilate with 100% oxygen? They are blue. Do you immediately intubate the patient to try to get them some oxygen in their lungs? Do you start CPR? Or do you warm, warm them up in a nice blanket, kind of get them all dry, they are slimy little guys, and uh, kind of stimulate the baby? And our answer is D. So yeah, these kids are just born. They're not moving around. They haven't had any, they're not used to breathing yet. It's a new, a new thing for them. It's all foreign, so by getting in there, freezing, and they're brought outside, they're wet, so they're gonna get cold. So warm them up, stimulate them. Um, you can thump their feet. That was one of my favorites. They'll start crying. That in and of itself will open up their lungs. They'll start to breathe. Their heart rate will bump up. Their color will perk up. You know, if that doesn't work, next option I think would be to uh, to ventilate, give them a, some breaths with a bag valve, and uh, that should do the trick for you. All right. Uh, we're talking now about a gentleman who has a history of shellfish allergy and coronary artery disease. Uh, you're called because he has hives, uh, edema of his lips and tongue, and loud wheezes. Uh, what drug do you give first? So this is a case of an acute allergic reaction. Uh, we've talked about treatment of allergic reactions several times over the past couple years as part of the MEC minutes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is, you've got a patient who has uh, swelling with acute allergic reaction. Uh, he has angioedema of the lips and tongue. He's got wheezes. Uh, and so he essentially is uh, got a major problem going on, is at risk to lose his airway. Um, did not list his blood pressure, but let's assume he's a little hypotensive. So what are we going to do for this gentleman? So are we going to give him Benadryl IV? Are we going to give him supplemental oxygen? Are we going to give them Decadron or are we going to give them epinephrine? So the question is, what is the first thing you do? So the, the correct answer is you're going to give them a dose of IM epinephrine. Uh, it's quick. It's fast. It doesn't require an IV start. Um, and it is life-saving. Uh, the drug of choice for acute allergic reactions, regardless of the patient's age, regardless of past medical history, is epinephrine, epinephrine, and epinephrine. Uh, you should not be going into these other medications unless the epinephrine has been administered. So uh, if you come on scene and the patient has an acute allergic reaction, uh, the first thing we do is to give the patient a dose of epinephrine. The, the protocol calls for 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of 1 to 1,000, which is 0 0.4 to, I'm sorry, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 milliliters of 1 to 1,000 epinephrine IM. Uh, if the patient has an EpiPen or something comparable, hopefully they've used it before you've arrived. Uh, but epinephrine comes first. Um, the fact that the patient has a coronary artery, artery disease is immaterial. Uh, it, we know he's got coronary artery disease, but if he dies from anaphylaxis, it doesn't matter whether he's got coronary artery disease or not. Um, so the patient gets epinephrine. The other things listed um, are appropriate, but they are done after the patient gets epinephrine. Yeah, that's great. I hear this all the time. It's like, oh, the child will have SBT. Do I really want to give them epi? The answer is yes. Um, a dead child or a dead patient with SBT or heart disease is still dead, so the epi is going to save him. The only adverse effect I've seen in 35 years of treating patients uh, with epinephrine for allergic reaction is when the medic accidentally gave the dose intravenously rather than IM. Uh, the patient was not hypotensive or in arrest, so IM was preferable. The patient had some transient ST changes on his electrocardiogram. We admitted him, observed him for 24 hours. He had a negative cardiac workup. Uh, so uh, he should not have gotten the medication IV, but even if he did, he didn't have any long-term effects of the medication. Next question has to do with a postpartum patient. She's a 31-year-old. <clears throat> excuse me, who is two weeks postpartum. Um, her blood pressure is 150 over 90, and she's got four plus edema of her lower legs and feet. Uh, during the seizure, she has a grand mal seizure. Uh, fortunately, you started an IV before you started the transport. So which treatment is correct for this patient? So this patient uh, has symptoms of preeclampsia. Um, you can have symptoms of preeclampsia up to 30 days after delivery, so it's not just a problem prior to delivery. Um, and unfortunately, she has a grand mal seizure, so she's no longer preeclamptic. She is eclamptic. 
So what's the treatment that we're going to provide? Are we going to give her uh, two milligrams of IV midazolam or Versed? Are we going to give her the Versed as well as magnesium sulfate? Uh, or are we just going to give her high flow oxygen, put her left uh, lateral decubitus position, and let her stop seizing on her own? Well, the correct answer is uh, number B. So yes, it, it is correct that we will give the patient IV midazolam, but uh, one of the unique ways that we treat the patients who are eclamptic or even preeclamptic is we give them magnesium sulfate as a bolus, and then the hospital will start the patient on an infusion of magnesium sulfate. Um, this is unique in terms of seizure care that I'm aware of. No other patient population gets magnesium sulfate. It's kind of an old world treatment for eclampsia, but it still works. So we carry magnesium in the truck. Um, we're going to give the patient two milligrams of IV Versed first to stop the seizure. We're going to administer four grams of IV magnesium sulfate over about 20 minutes. Uh, you mix it up in a 100 ml bag of saline and you infuse it. Um, you know, the biggest danger to this patient is the seizure and the accompanied hypoxia and everything else that goes with it. We need to stop the seizure. Uh, magnesium sulfate, if you give it too fast, has the potential to depress respirations. But most patients, if they receive this 4-gram load over 20 minutes, are going to do fine. Plus, you're the airway guys. If the patient uh, has airway compromise because of these medications, manage the airway. But we've got to stop the seizure. We've got to treat the eclampsia. Good review. I always often, as a pediatrician, forget about preeclampsia and eclampsia postpartum. So, yeah. And matter of fact, I, I see more complications of preeclampsia and eclampsia postpartum simply because if they come in at 38 weeks with these symptoms, they go right to LND. Well, that makes sense. Uh, I'm more likely to see them when they're brought in uh, because they've been discharged and now they have a problem. Gotcha. All right. You're called upon and you're treating a seven year old. Patient has a history of asthma, and they call you because the patient is short of breath. Uh, you get there, he's a little tachycardic, 120. He's breathing fast with 40 respirations per minute. His blood pressure is 110 over 70. And his oxygen saturation on room air is 90%. Uh, you go ahead and you listen to his lungs. You don't hear a lot of air movement, but what is moving is wheezing kind of throughout. So this is one of those backwards questions. What is the inappropriate therapy? What would you not want to do? So. A, would you give him an albuterol aerosol? B, would you give him, I'm oh, sorry, A, would you give him a duonab, albuterol nipotropium? B, would you give him albuterol? Is it okay just to give albuterol? C, would you give him uh, saline only nab? Uh, would you give him IMAPI? Is that an option for asthma treatment? Or would you uh, administer a dose of steroids? So the inappropriate one of those is the saline. So definitely you want to give them some kind of bronchodilator, whether you're grabbing a duoneb with albuterol and ipitropium or just grabbing albuterol alone, um, you're giving them some type of bron bronchodilator. That is good. Um, D, I am epi. I use that quite frequently for my patients who are really tight. Uh, if I'm giving aerosols and they're just still not moving air um, or they have the so-called silent chest of very little air movement, um, I am epi will give you a little of a kickstart. And then definitely, time to steroids is something that we monitor. We know that the sooner steroids are given, the sooner, uh, the more likely they are to have a, either a shortened hospital course or possibly even going home from the emergency department. So earlier the better. So if you give them a dose of steroids, it's great. And then obviously the, the wrong answer, the one we chose in this one, the saline, uh, doesn't really do a whole lot. Just gets you nice, moist airways. Next question has to do with adults in cardiac arrest. Uh, we've made some changes to our uh, protocol for cardiac arrest uh, starting in 2019. So uh, what changes did we make? What's going to be different next year? Are we going to go to a CPR compression rate of 15 to 2? Um, are we going to have a preference to humoral I.O. versus tibial I.O.? Um, are we going to cap the dose of epinephrine uh, at five doses? Um, or are we going to start using lidocaine and get rid of the amiodarone? So there are more than one answer may apply on this one. Uh, that should kind of give you a clue right there. Uh, so the first one that's correct is uh, our, we've moved toward a preference toward a humoral I.O. For over the tibial I.O. Um, you know, uh, patients in cardiac arrest are in a low flow state. So uh, medications that are administered through a tibial I.O. Uh, may be delayed in terms of reaching the central circulation. 
whereas humor IOs uh, are, have much quicker access to the central circulation, and even in a low flow state, uh, the humeral IO is better than a tibial IO. So if there's an opportunity to do the humeral IO versus the tibial uh, in a cardiac arrest, uh, please take it. Uh, what's nice about a tibial IO is the operator is out of the way of everybody else. But um, maybe you just need to adjust your work practices so that whoever's going to do the IO does it up at the shoulder uh, and, he, and he or she has a chance to get to it. The second answer that is correct is that we've capped epinephrine at five doses. Um, the studies show that epinephrine really has minimal effect in cardiac arrest. We still use it. Uh, epinephrine use in cardiac arrest is associated with a poorer outcome. Uh, is that because epinephrine has a detrimental effect on the patient, or is it because the patient's just less likely to survive anyway? Uh, I don't think the answer's in on that, but there's no doubt that if you receive IV epinephrine as a cardiac arrest patient in the field, the likelihood that you're going to survive to discharge from the hospital is less than if you didn't get epinephrine. So uh, there's been a lot of literature out there, and there's a suggestion that uh, after four or five doses, epinephrine isn't going to show any better effect after the fifth dose. So we're capping it at five doses. Um, I would not be surprised if eventually we just go to no using, using no epinephrine, although that's going to be a hard habit for all of us to break. Well, definitely. Little uh, cyanide kit uh, question. Uh, we do carry the cyanide kits. Uh, not every truck carries them. That uh, hopefully everybody has access uh, to the cyanide kit, uh, either through uh, the medic they're on or through a responding company. I know in some of our more rural circumstances, the cyanide kits are shared between agencies, um, but they are uh, a valuable resource in some circumstances. So uh, when when should we use a cyanide kit? Uh, one of them is if the patient's got a suspected cyanide poisoning. So if you have a patient who is an overdose and you find a bottle of cyanide at the uh, next to the patient or they work in an industry where cyanide is used as part of manufacturing and they're exposed and you suspect the patient's had a cyanide poisoning, should you use it? Uh, should you use it for a patient uh, whose firefighter goes down at the scene? Or should you use it for a patient who's had a closed space exposure to smoke, so they're in a fire, uh, and they've got altered LOC, and you can see evidence of inhalational injury? So which of these is a purpose, or when should you use a cyanide kit? And the correct answer is all of the above. So I was kind of obvious in my discussion about the suspected overdose or uh, cyanide poisoning. Definitely use it. Uh, if you have a firefighter who's been actively uh, fighting the fire, he's been involved with fire suppression or even overhaul, and he goes down at the scene, uh, we will include cyanokid as part of our resuscitation of that firefighter. Mm -hmm. uh, or if the patient's a victim of a closed space smoke exposure with altered LOC and nasal soot, the likelihood that they've had uh, cyanide exposure is high. So in all these circumstances, we would use the cyanokid. Uh, it is safe to use. Uh, the biggest side effect is the patient may look a little red, and if they survive, they may be a little hypertensive. Um, but keep in mind that cyanide is a metabolic poison that works fast, and it is uh, uh, deadly if not treated quickly. So if you think the patient's at risk, use the cyanide kit. It's safe for kids, too. Safe the dosing, for kids, too. Yeah. The, yeah, the dosing is 70 milligrams per kilo up to the adult dose, which is the 5-gram box. So if you're not used to uh, the kit, you don't know how to use it, I suggest you uh, review the materials on it so you know how to mix it. It is a little finicky. You have to tilt the bottle back and forth rather than shake it up, and you have to administer it over 15 minutes. Yeah, we don't use it very often, but it is in our protocol. Six-year-old. All right, six-year-old boy has a three-day history of vomiting and frequent urination. I will say this is an otherwise healthy six-year-old. Uh, you are called because he is sleepy and the parents are concerned. When you get there, you find that he is pretty sleepy. He has some dry mucous membranes. Uh, his heart rate is beating at 160 beats per minute. His blood pressure is at 70 over 40. Um, you do get an IV access, and what do you, uh, what do you give him through that IV? So, or do you give him anything? Answer A, do you just put your IV in, put a saline lock on it, and call it a day? Do you give them 20 milliliters per kilogram of uh, normal saline and uh, check a blood sugar? Do you give them 20, uh, excuse me, do you give them 100 milliliters an hour? Just put them on some maintenance, 100 milliliters an hour of saline. Do you hand them some oral Zofran and then do a, a PO challenge, give them some fluids? 
And the correct answer is 20 per kilo of saline and check a blood sugar. Yeah, this child probably has some gastroenteritis, but he looks like he's, he's pretty dry. Uh, you look at your blood pressure, and if you look at PALS, you want two times the age plus 70 to be your, your low uh, systolic, and he's below that. So he's a little shocky, so you start with a bolus, check a blood sugar because he has, probably hasn't been keeping anything down, and reevaluate. He may need more fluid, but that's a good spot to start. Uh, you don't just want to give him some maintenance fluid and drive him in. You definitely don't want to ignore your IV. You put it there for a reason. And then, yeah, he's kind of gone beyond that oral fluid challenge. So correct answer, B. Yeah, I always think that you, you can't do enough blood sugars. You can't do too many blood sugars. So yeah. I tried to paint the picture that this kid's sick. Um, I didn't throw in a temperature, but, uh, you know, my concern is could this kid be diabetic and DKA? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would always check a blood sugar, particularly if a child looks ill uh, and looks dry and has abnormal vital signs. Now, if the, child's, yeah. if the child's febrile, I'll leave that to the pediatricians, yeah. but I, 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 I always think that we can uh, do blood sugars and there's no such thing as too many finger sticks. Right, especially when he's sleepy too, so that could be a cause. Uh, oh, another kitty. Back to me. So you were called to a private residence with a six-month-old child uh, that is apneic. You get there, the history is he was apneic, he turned blue, he went limp. Uh, this all happened after the parents had fed him, they laid him down, and they found him in this state a few minutes later. Uh, parents scooped him up, called a 911, and then started CPR by the mother. You guys show up. You see the child, he's awake, he's a six month old, he's smiling at you, his vitals all look good. Um, you don't see anything on the child, what should you do? Should you check a blood sugar? Back to your blood sugar question. And then if it looks normal, leave him there. Should you just say, hey, he looks good, turn around and drive off? Um, check a blood sugar and go uh, take him to a children's hospital. Um, take him to the nearest hospital or put him in a C collar, a backboard and transfer him to a trauma center. Correct answer is check a blood sugar. Again, goes back to checking blood sugars when something's not looking right, and then bring them to NCH. This falls along our brewy brew, or uh, the old term for or the new term for the old alti. Um, brew stands for brief resolved unexplained event, and that's exactly what he had. He went apneic. He turned blue. He went limp. It was brief. It resolved. It's unexplained. He looks great to you, but we don't know why. Um, so the protocol. Um, just take him to NCH or the Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, there we'll evaluate him further. Most of these kids, or a good number of these kids, will end up staying in the hospital. We often in the emergency department don't have answers as well, but we do watch him and observe him to make sure it hasn't happened again. Okay, so next question has to do with an intoxicated 22-year-old male. It's Friday night and he's had a little bit too much to drink. So you get called to see him at the local pub. Uh, he apparently fell off the stool. He's awake or oriented to place and month. Um, he is obviously intoxicated. He's got large bruise or scalp hematoma at the back of his head. Uh, he doesn't recall the fall. Uh, his vital signs are fine. His glucose is normal. He repeatedly asks you the same questions over and over again. He probably says the word dude to every other word. Um, he says he's okay, dude, <clears throat> but he's uh, refusing transport. Um, so the question is, does he have the capacity to make informed decision and refu refuse transport? So this is a capacity question. Uh, and when we make a determination of capacity, um, it's not just are they oriented times four. So does this gentleman have the capacity to refuse transport? Dude, I'm good. I don't have to go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I can't remember what I just said. So yeah. the answer to me is no. So, uh, you know, you're in a circumstance where you have to make a decision over whether or not this patient understands the risks of refusing transport. Uh, I would say at this point, uh, every indication is he does not. Uh, so it's not just is he awake, alert, oriented times four. Uh, he has to have an understanding of the risks and benefits, and more importantly, he has to be able to recount them. So if you tell them that he's got a big bruise on the back of his head and maybe he's got a skull fracture or a bleeding of the brain, and two minutes later he doesn't remember what you said, uh, cannot paraphrase what your concerns are, or if he keeps asking you the same questions over and over again and you keep telling him the same answer and he still can't remember, he does not have the capacity to refuse. That patient needs to be taken to the hospital. 
Uh, might there be a complaint later that uh, he got stuck with a thousand dollar hospital bill? If he's lucky, it'd be that low. Mm-hmm. Um, and now he, he, you know, he thinks you uh, abducted him and took him to the hospital against his will. Uh, I think that's perfectly defensible on our part because you acted on his best interest and he did not have the capacity to understand the risks and benefits. And honestly, I would much rather be in the corner of justifying what we did and defending us against alleged uh, abduction versus he, he uh, doesn't go to the hospital. Uh, two hours later, you're called back and he's got a big epidural uh, hematoma or a big bleed into the head. And now we have to uh, defend an accusation of abandonment. So I, I think this is a patient who has to go to the hospital, um, let the chips fall how they may, but this gentleman does not have the capacity to make an informed decision. I totally agree. I think one, the one spin off of that is good documentation. Bring him in and say why you actually, he's not able to make his own decision. He's re- being repetitive. We're taking him in. So when he does complain about the bill, we just say, here it is. Yeah, here it is. And we, we do have two different forms available in the protocol. They're not mandatory, but there's guidelines. Uh, if you don't have something like that available for use, talk to your su- uh, EMS supervisor or chief. Figure out a way to get something like that available in the field so you can use it. Having something like that with checkboxes marked off um, and scanned into the record is a, is a great protection for you and for your department. All right. You're called again. You have a uh, four-month-old who's just not waking up, sleepy. Uh, you get there. Uh, you're met at the door by, uh, by a gentleman who is mother's boyfriend. He states that the dog jumped on him. I don't think it was a chihuahua. Um, you go to see the patient. You assess him. You do, are able to wake him up, but he just cries and cries, very inconsolable. You notice some linear marks on the side of the child's head and face. What is your neck, or what would be the inappropriate thing to do from as a next step? Would you check a blood sugar and establish an IV? Uh, would you encourage the boyfriend to take him to the hospital? Would you put him in C-spine precautions and transfer him to a trauma center? Uh, and if the time allows, would you wait for the police to arrive and assess the situation? So which one would be inappropriate to do? So this is a good case of the story is not really consistent with the injury. Um, he's got linear marks on his side of his head, you're concerned about a hand mark, uh, not a dog bite. Um, the dog was a chihuahua, probably wouldn't have knocked him over. Um, so you're worried that there may be some non accidental trauma going on. And the only person there right now is mom's boyfriend, so you don't want to have him take him off and give him custody of the child. You do worry about the kid is very grumpy and sleepy, so a blood sugar is good. Establish an IV in case you need it. Um, we are worried about some trauma here. There are marks on his head, so um, spinal precautions are the right answer and then taking him somewhere that can evaluate him further. And then again, per our protocol, um, police should be involved if they haven't gotten there already. If there's time, we can wait for them. If the child needs to be transferred emergently, then transfer him emergently. And is this one of those cases where the injury doesn't match um, what the child's able to do? Definitely. Four month old may be able to roll over, but um, wouldn't really roll off of things. And again, the dog kind of playing with him depends on where it is, but. I think the injury does not match what the, the story tells you. Yeah, okay. You always be aware of those injuries where the, the child's milestones don't right. match what the injuries yeah. uh, are alleged to be. We, we do see a lot of kids who are not able to roll over who have rolled off the bed or done some type of, the story is they've rolled off the bed or have done something that they're just not compatible with doing. Most kids roll over at about six months of age. They could scoot a little bit, but... Um, um, a lot of times you'll hear very uh, made-up stories, so just keep that in mind. All right, uh, next question. Uh, this is really a question that's in many ways based on all the what-ifs I hear from the guys in the field. So um, there's no way we can cover all the what-ifs in the protocol. Uh, but one of the most common what-ifs is, you know, do I have to do a report on this patient? What happens if I get called to an auto accident and they don't want me to see them? So uh, you know, the question here that we're, that's being posed is, um, you know, what constitutes a patient encounter? And so um, our protocol says a patient is any human ha- being who has face-to-face contact with an on-duty EMS provider 
that meets one or more of the following criteria. So which of the following criteria are correct? It says pick all that apply. So it means at least one is correct, but probably more than one is correct. So, you know, what, what meets the definition of a patient, which then means we have to do a written report on the patient. So uh, really, uh, I'm just gonna jump the gun here. All, all of them are correct. This is a direct quote from our clinical standard. So any patient who has a complaint that suggests a potential injury or illness, any uh, requests that are made uh, either by the patient or by someone on behalf of the patient uh, for an evaluation for potential illness or injury, uh, anyone who has an obvious illness or injury, so you're called on scene and you know, the patient's leg is in three different pieces, uh, that's an obvious injury. Um, uh, any patient uh, has experienced an acute event that can reasonably be expected to result in illness or injury. Think about the guy from a couple questions ago who fell off of the bar stool. He had an acute event that can be reasonably expected to result in illness or injury. So that patient is, that is a patient encounter. Or there's a circumstance or situation that could reasonably result in illness or injury. Again, circumstance. So these are all conditions that if one or more are present, then it is a patient encounter and there has to be a, a run report. Um, I also received questions about, okay, we went on an auto accident, there are three victims, uh, they didn't want us to see them. Um, what do we do? Do we have to do a run report? Well, the answer is, if you made it to the, to the vehicle and you saw the patient face to face or eye to eye, you need to do a report. Now, do you do one report with three names on it? Um, do you do three different reports? That's between you and the chief. Um, what do you document? You document what you're able to verify. So if the patient is declining assessment, denies injury, but they're awake, alert, ambulatory scene with no apparent injury, write it down. What we don't want is for a uh, request for records to come through because there's pending legal action and we have no records on the encounter. Uh, uh, but the patient then saying, yeah, the medics were there. So document what you can uh, and do the best you can. Any of these circumstances constitute a patient encounter and there needs to be a run report. So I have a couple questions on that. If you have, if you're called to an auto accident, as you mentioned, and a different unit is responding to, you go over to see a patient and like, oh, unit X has that one, we need to do that one. Do you have to respond at all to the first one or? No. You don't just. No, because you did not, that, the, 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 the unit you're talking about only had face-to-face -face with the one patient. Okay, so. um, the, other, the other unit is responsible for the other patient. Okay. That could be an engine company or somebody else. And you know, if it's an engine company and they decide that they don't need to have the medics respond or they cancel the medic before the engine, or after the engine company gets there, the engine company still has to do a run report based upon the information they can get. I would encourage you to do at least vital signs if they'll allow you to do it. I mean, if the patient is awake, alert, has the capacity to refuse care, uh, and they don't want you to touch them, then we have to respect that. So, but it is okay for two units to walk up on one patient and then divert and see yes. different patients and that one has yeah. it. The other question is, what if you're, you know, it's lunchtime, I'm hungry, and you're um, in the grocery store and no one has called you to see somebody fall and you're on duty, that is still a patient encounter? Yeah, uh, because there's an acute event that could reasonably be expected to result in illness or injury. That's okay. number D. Yeah, and you're on duty. Yeah, you don't want to be in a position where they say, oh, you know, the medic was here and Just they left. didn't bother to look at right. me, but they saw me fall. It was lunchtime. That, that's, a chief, that's a call that the chief really doesn't want to receive. Yeah. Okay, uh, here's another one. Um, uh, Bush hog accident, 27-year-old uh, kid, uh, or male, I should say, suffered above the knee amputation of left leg. Uh, with his legs still under the running bush hog, so the, the, uh, the fail-safe has been bypassed and the, the blades mm -hmm. are still turning. Large amount of blood on the scene. Patient's awake, confused, and diaphoretic. He's hypotensive and tachycardic. Um, no other obvious injury. What is your correct sequence of actions to follow? Uh, should you intubate, get a saline lock, put a dressing on, and give some TXA? Um, should you secure the scene, apply a tourniquet, administer IV fluids, uh, and then give TXA? Or are you going to give them oxygen, IV access, and TXA? So I, I hope this is a pretty obvious answer for everybody. The first thing is scene safety. Um, mm -hmm. You guys are the experts on scene safety. Uh, make the scene secure, which to me means you shut the bush hog down. Uh, you make sure that uh, nobody's in a position to get hurt. Um, we're going to stop the bleeding. So if you look at uh, trauma care now, particularly in terms of like active shooter, 
uh, massive hemorrhage is controlled before we worry about the airway. So uh, a quick application of one or two tourniquets, whatever is necessary to stop the bleeding on this leg. If it's a leg, you may need two tourniquets. Um, we are going to start IV fluids. Uh, we do have a uh, protocol for permissive hypotension for trauma, meaning uh, we want to get their blood pressure up a little bit, but if they're a little hypotensive, that's okay, because if uh, we get them back to a normal pressure, they may blow a clot off. Um, that really has to be balanced with some patients if they have head injuries, because head injuries don't do well if they're hypotensive. But this patient has an isolated leg injury and they've bled out. So we're going to put a tourniquet on. We're going to give him uh, up to two liters of fluid to get to a goal pressure of 90. If he gets to 90 with one liter, we'll stop. And then we're going to give him TXA uh, because uh, it's obvious uh, exsanguinating, exsanguinating uh, injury. Uh, and TXA administered early in the course of the injury has been shown to have a beneficial effect. Since we have a pediatrician in the room, we acknowledge that it's not accepted for use in kids under it's 18. not. Had the kid been 10 years earlier, he wouldn't have gotten it. But we are doing studies, so more to come down the road. But as of now, we don't use the TXA in the kids. And we don't use TXA in pregnant ladies, um, although if you don't know the pregnant lady's pregnant or not, TXA is appropriate. And we don't use TXA for isolated head injuries because simply it just not has been, there haven't been enough studies, there haven't been any studies to show that TXA with an isolated head injury is beneficial. Now, if the patient is bleeding out but also has a head injury, give them the TXA. Right. All right, cardiac case. All right, you got a 32-year-old male called 911 because of palpitations. He's having chest pressure and dyspnea that started 10 minutes before your arrival. You put him on a cardiac monitor. His pressure is 110 over 80. What do you do? So you see the rhythm strip. Um, how are we going to treat him? Are we going to have him stand on his head? Uh, are we going to give him adenosine 12 milligrams rapid IV push? Or are we just going to shock him with 360 of unsynchronized uh, uh, current? Or are we going to give him amiodarone at 300 milligrams rapid IV push? So what's the correct answer? And there's only one correct answer. Uh, question 28. We're nearing the end here, guys. 74-year-old uh, with COPD, CHF, and diabetes. Uh, he is dyspneic and confused on your arrival. Uh, he's unable to speak and really does not respond to verbal. Uh, he has distant breath sounds with wheezes over all lung fields. His respiratory rate is 8 with uh, uh, oxygen at 3 liters by cannula. Um, not sure what 70, I think, is his pulse rate. There's a typo there. His end tidal CO2 is 60. What are you going to do? Are you going to give him nebulized albuterol and atrovent uh, and give him steroids? Are you going to put him on CPAP and transport? Are you going to put him on high flow oxygen and transport? Are you going to ventilate with a BVM and 100% O2, uh, sedate with ketamine, uh, followed by sucks as a paralytic, and then intubate? Or are you going to call for a priest? Um, well, if you don't things, do things right, you may end up having to call for that yeah. priest. Uh, but for me, the correct answer is ventilate um, uh, with uh, O2, uh, sedate, paralyze, and intubate. I tried to to paint a dismal picture. Uh, if this patient was uh, dyspneic but uh, awake and talking, uh, if their SAO2 was better, if their uh, end title was better, uh, you could make an argument for um, uh, nebulized meds or CPAP and transport. This patient is dying. He needs to be intubated. Um, there is no other appropriate treatment. Uh, I would go to ventilating with a BVM and 100% O2 as you prepare for intubation. Um, you can make an argument to transiently put them on CPAP while you prepare to intubate, um, but I, th I would hope that you can get him set up quick enough for intubation that you, it would take more time to get CPAP set up than to just be ventilate with a BVM. So for me, this is a uh, ventilate with 100% O2, uh, get him paralyzed, and get him intubated. This is a great vignette that displays respiratory failure. Yes. This guy is in bad shape. Uh, he needs an artificial airway. Okay, uh, you're dispatched on a cardiac arrest, uh, bystander CPR is in progress. The battalion chief uh, gets there first and he's three minutes ahead of everybody else. Uh, she gets there, uh, starts CPR and applies an AED that recommends shock. Uh, uh, shock is administered and uh, on your arrival the patient is awake complaining of chest pain. 
Uh, his vital signs are pretty good. Uh, blood pressure is 120 over 80. His pulse rate's only 110. I think if you just shocked mm -hmm. me awake, my pulse rate would be 140. Mm -hmm. His O2 saturation is normal at 98%. So you've got four actions in place. Which one uh, do I consider to be incorrect? Um, obtaining IV access. Are you going to give the patient IV amiodarone over 10 minutes? Are you going to obtain a 12-lead electrocardiogram? Or are you going to give oxygen, high-flow oxygen by a non-rebreather mask? So um, there are no god-awful wrong answers here, but there's one that I think is incorrect, and that is uh, option D. So uh, we are going to obtain IV access. The patient just suffered a cardiac arrest. Um, because it was a VF arrest, we are going to give the patient amiodarone over 10 minutes, and we're going to get a 12-lead electrocardiogram. So remember, as part of our arrest algorithm, that if we successfully resuscitate a patient, one of the things we need to do in the field is to obtain a 12-lead electrocardiogram. The reason I consider option D is incorrect is because the patient's got an O2 saturation of 98%. Uh, our protocol for oxygen administration is that we're going to give the patient oxygen as necessary to maintain uh, an SAO2 over uh, 94%. So this patient's got a normal oxygenation. He does not need supplemental oxygen. <clears throat> so that's why I, I chose select uh, or option D. So the next question builds on the previous question. You do a 12-lead electrocardiogram on this person who uh, is post-arrest, and you see the you see the 12-lead uh, electrocardiogram off there to the right. So uh, what are you going to do for this patient at this point? And again, more than one option may apply. Are you going to give them a 324 milligrams of chewable aspirin? Are you going to notify the receiving hospital of a STEMI alert? Are you going to give the patient IV fentanyl as needed for pain? Are you going to uh, shave and prep the groin for cardiac cath, or are you going to administer IV lidocaine? So for me, again, it's kind of obvious. I'm shooting for more than one right answer. Uh, the electrocardiogram, to my review, shows an acute anterior MI. He's got ST elevation. Uh, looks like leads V1 through at least V5, uh, maybe even V6. Uh, so he's got an acute anterior STEMI, uh, and it kind of goes across the precordium. So my concern is, could this guy have an uh, obstructing lesion of his um, left main stem or the left anterior descending arteries? Um, the left main stem used to be called the Widowmaker. Uh, if the, it's the main artery uh, that goes to the left coronary, uh, as well as to the circumflex. So it's a big, big problem. So yes, we're going to give him aspirin, which is required by protocol for STEMIs. Um, we are going to notify the receiving hospital that they're going to be getting a STEMI, and uh, if at all possible, we're going to send them the 12 lead ahead of time so they can look at it, and uh, that should assist them in uh, uh, calling in the cath team and, and contacting cardiology. And then we are going to give the patient IV fentanyl as needed for pain. So IV fentanyl is safe and appropriate for patients who are having an MI uh, and have a need for, uh, for uh, pain medication. So uh, IV fentanyl is appropriate. Yeah. Oops. Oops. I'm sorry. That's all right. Just as an aside, for the pediatrician in the room, what's uh, what happened to Mona? Uh, Mona, we stay away from the high flow oxygen. It's now uh, oxygen if needed, fentanyl, uh, nitro maybe, uh, depending on their blood pressure, and aspirin. Okay. Sorry, guys. I jumped the gun on that. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, and then I think there was a question about lidocaine. Patients already got an amiodarone. We're not going to give them lidocaine. Um, we did have two bonus questions, um, and um, this one is mine, uh, and this one is uh, based upon uh, experience over the years. Uh, what is the most common reason uh, a chief or an EMS coordinator calls me as the medical director regarding something bad that happened with a patient? Is it because the patient... Um, uh, misplaced or uh, failed to recognize a, uh, a dislodged endotracheal tube or they put the endotracheal tube in the wrong place or there's medication error or because the Board of Pharmacy comes in and does an inspection and finds a problem with our process or because there's a patient injury during transport. Why well, is it a little click, click on the clicker? The obvious answer is medication error and this is true. I am more likely to get called by the chief or EMS coordinator because the patient got the wrong medication accidentally or the incorrect dose of medication. Um, so uh, it's medication error. Um, I'm not aware of any recent problems in terms of failure of identify a dislodged endotracheal tube or failure to identify a tube placed in the wrong place. Um, we occasionally have problems with the board of pharmacy agents, but it generally doesn't result in a phone call to me and um, we have very few patient injuries during transport. 
but it is medication error. And medication errors are one of those never events. They s simply should not happen. Uh, we have checks and balances in place. So we have a, um, a medication cross-check uh, protocol in place as one of our clinical standards. If this is followed, uh, the patient should get the correct medication via the correct route and in the correct uh, dosage. Uh, the problems that we have is either a medic pulls uh, the wrong medication because there's confusion over labeling of the vials, or the concentration of the medication is different than what they're expecting. So, for instance, we may have two different concentrations of ketamine or two different concentrations of midazolam. The higher concentration of ketamine is meant for intramuscular use versus the lower dose for intravenous use, or the higher dose of midazolam for intranasal use versus the lower dose for intravenous use. Sometimes the intranasal uh, concentration of midazolam is drawn up as a syringe and given IV, and the correct volume is given if the correct concentration was chosen. The patient gets, instead of a milligram or two milligrams of IV midazolam, gets five milligrams. Uh, we've had an episode where a patient got uh, 50 milligrams of intravenous ketamine instead of 50 micrograms of uh, fentanyl. Uh, patient had an apneic episode. His kidney stone pain, away, pain went away, but he was apneic. He had to be bagged. Uh, it was an adverse event, uh, potential risk for liability to the, to the EMS provider. So these are preventable uh, if we follow the process in place. It's a two-person process. You verify the indication for the medication. You verify the medication you're going to give. You verify the, the vial and the concentration. You verify that the correct amount has been drawn up, and then you administer the medication. So please, if you are not familiar with this, go back and look at it. It could prevent a lot of uh, uh, lost nights of sleep if you are familiar with the process. Goes back to the five rights that the nurses all taught us in yes. as interns. Yes. Second bonus question. All right, <laughs> finishing up. You're on the scene of a four-year-old who has had five days of vomiting and diarrhea. Um, he has not urinated one day. He's listless when you arrive. Um, his heart rate is 139. He's breathing at 32. His blood pressure is 80 over 55. Which below is not the appropriate action? Um, would you get an IV or an IO, some type of an access? Would you check a blood sugar? Would you give him a bolus of fluid of D5.9? Would you give him, put him on a monitor? Would you give him a bolus of fluid of D5 normal saline? And the correct, incorrect answer is um, the sugar-containing fluid. You don't know what his sugar is right now. Um, and we bolus with isotonic or the normal saline. We don't want to bolus with any kind of sugar-containing fluids. Will he need sugar? He may need sugar, but that's not, not the proper route to do it. So don't bolus with the D5, just bolus with normal saline. And that sounds good. So this is just a question. Uh, yeah. You know, there's been a lot of discussion recently, at least in the adult world, about fluids used for volume resuscitation. Um, you know, we we have used normal saline for years. We mm -hmm. continue to use normal saline, uh, but now there's a push to consider it using balanced saline solutions like Bringer's Lactate for adults. Um, how about with kids? Um, I will say that we're looking into that. Uh, it's coming up more and more frequently. Is Ringers is lactate of Ringers a better solution than normal saline? Is what plasma light? There, what is the best uh, rehydration or resuscitation fluid? And we're studying it for now. We still go to, we still kind of revert back to normal saline. But we're we're looking at, I think those are probably the, the three main ones. Lactate of Ringers is starting to get a little more of a, a push up as being more appropriate. But I don't think we've I don't think uh, it's gone mainline yet. I think most of the studies, at least with adults, say that a couple of liters of saline is not a big deal versus Ringer's lactate. Right. But if you're talking about a patient who's going to get large volumes of resuscitative fluids and then be ha receiving ongoing fluids after that, then there may be a difference between um, uh, normal saline and the associated risk for hyperchloremic acidosis versus Ringer's lactate, which and we are seeing. So. Yeah, and we're, like I said, we're looking more into that. The only one we've gone full board on with the uh, lactated Ringer's is uh, our burn population. Well, that's it, guys. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, we do want to know about any comments. Hopefully, this has been an educational event for you. Our main purpose to having a protocol assessment is for training and education. If you have any questions uh, or concerns, feel free to post them on Workplace uh, or send it to me uh, via my uh, Violet Township address. 
if you send it to me to, uh, via email, there's a good chance I'm going to quote you and post it uh, on Workplace. Although, uh, if you send it to me via email, I, I will honor your uh, anonymity. I, will, I won't quote you as asking this question. But I uh, really do want to know what you think about this. Hopefully, it's been entertaining as well as educational. Good. Mike, any comments? No, I think it's been great. And uh, we'll see what happens next time. All right. Thanks again. So we're going to give him a dentist now, question A says standing the patient on his head. Um, we could use the Valsava maneuver. Mm -hmm. Standing somebody on their head could be seen as that type of maneuver, but it's not something that we advocate. I do know patients, including my mother-in-law, who in the past have had SVT and they've stood on their head and aborts the, the, the uh, SVT. It's not part of the protocol. You don't encourage your mother-in-law to be on her head? <laughs> no, no. Uh, she went and had her ablation. She's okay. doing fine. But this is SVT. Uh, I see the rate's probably about 180. Uh, we're going to give the patient 12 milligrams of IV uh, adenosine. Uh, we used to give 6, then 12, then 12. Uh, but several years ago when we collaborated with the city of Columbus in terms of sharing protocols, uh, they found that it was more effective just to go to 12, and that's what we've done. Uh, and uh, I think that we've had less uh, treatment failures with first dose of meds with the 12 milligrams versus the 6. My clinical experience is the patient's going to hate you whether you give them 6 or 12. It's still uncomfortable for 15 seconds. Just give them the 12. Are you going to give them unsynchronized shock at 360? No. Uh, if the patient is unstable, uh, so if his pressure was 70 instead of 110, we would do uh, synchronized um, uh, cardioversion, and hopefully you would be nice enough to sedate him or her first. Uh, and uh, we're not going to give m on a 300 milligrams rapid IV push. Uh, that's only appropriate if the patient's in a VF arrest and need m uh, You can justify using m for SVT, particularly if you think they have uh, WPW or Wolf-Parkinson's White Syndrome or if you think they're in atrial fibrillation with RVR or atrial flutter. But uh, 300 milligrams of amiodarone IV push is only appropriate in a patient who's in cardiac arrest with VF. A uh, patient here has to do with uh, patient uh, transport uh, between facilities. Uh, you're transporting the patient from an outlying hospital to a trauma center. You are in an ALS truck, uh, and the patient is receiving a blood transfusion. Uh, what, which statement is incorrect? So we, we have seen increased number of interfacility transfers uh, via 911 vehicles. Uh, to a large extent, that's because of uh, increased number of freestanding emergency departments in our communities. So we now have a protocol that uh, covers these patients. Uh, if you're not aware of it, I suggest you look at it because it's there to protect you. Uh, so the question of which of these options is incorrect. So the patient has a unit of blood hanging. Um, can you, um, uh, or can you continue the current unit of blood but not hang any additional units? Um, can you give additional units during transport as ordered by the treating physician? Um, can you request a nurse accompany you on the transport? So which one of these is incorrect? Um, this is all based upon scope of practice as well as a position statement issued by uh, the MFATS board. And the correct answer, or the incorrect answer, the answer that you should not say is something you can do, is you cannot hang any additional units during transport. So if a unit of blood is hanging, you may continue the unit of blood. Uh, but once it's done, you're done. Uh, we do have a protocol now that's been added as part of our uh, supplemental section of the protocol that covers blood transfusions. You need to document uh, the unit was given. You need to document um, the serial number or the identification number of that unit of blood. But once that blood is done, you cannot hang any additional units. If the provider or the physician who's transferring the patient wants more blood given, then uh, you need to have a nurse on the truck uh, who can do that as part of her scope of practice. Uh, the other point, uh, question, or I'm sorry, answer C is correct in that if you are on an interfacility transfer, you have the prerogative to request that a nurse accompany you on the transport if you're not comfortable with what's being done with that patient. So don't feel bad about asking a nurse uh, to, or asking the facility to provide a nurse to go with you. Is you give them enough to have return of spontaneous respirations. Our goal is not to give them enough to wake them up. We want them to start breathing normally with normal oxygenation. Uh, I can tell you no ED provider wants to manage a patient that you have put in active withdrawal. Uh, they're more likely to leave even before the 
position as an opportunity to evaluate them. Uh, so our goal is to uh, give enough to have a return of adequate respirations. Uh, we do not use Narcan solely for the purpose of making a diagnosis, uh, and uh, we really should not be using Narcan for patients in cardiac arrest. Uh, the AMA, or I'm sorry, the American Heart Association has even made that statement that patients in cardiac arrest from suspected uh, narcotic overdose have no benefit uh, by uh, being treated with Narcan. So save the Narcan for those patients uh, who are in cardiac arrest. I guess it's a fine line. You want them to breathe, but you don't want them fighting you in the back of the rig you know, either. Yes, yes. You don't want them jonesing in the truck. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The next